Hello everyone. I'm Rian Rosen, Natural History Curator at Bristol Museum. We have in our care an 18th century Jamaican Natural History collection. We have Arthur Bolton Herberia collected in 1780s and his translation of the breadfruit recipes from Latin. We have Reverend John Lindsay's manuscript the works provide a clear account of the flora and fauna of the region from Lindsay's perspective in 1750s. And we have Robert Long's manuscript that has yet to be studied. We were very fortunate to have Mama D deliver an immersive workshop combining performance, sound, touch, smell and taste, bringing the truth and controversial aspect of the collection to life. Hi, I am Mama D, a lead curator of Community Centred Knowledge, a collective which has been inspired to learn, explore and develop grassroots embodied knowledges across the pluriverse of being, and also to engage with critical narratives of dispossession and its resistances. We bring you a quote from Chinua Achebe, Nigerian author and thought leader. Until the lions have their own historians, tales of hunting will always glorify the hunter. We have to be careful, therefore, of how the institutions in which we work become part of the structuring of colonial and universalized knowledges, responsible for the erasure and extraction of the knowledges of people who have undergone oppression. Although many items within museums carry their own stories and come from within their own contexts, this embodied knowledge, if representing the colonized, are less commonly explored within their own parameters as understood by the colonized. What tends to be evident is that the discourse is developed around curated items which objectifies them as part of the narrative of those who acquired them. Why should this be the case? Why should the arrangements and the depictions of museum objects not tell the narratives that reflects fully where they come from through the perspective of their sources? It would appear that Chinua Achebe is onto something here because what the perspective seem to be saying is more Cartesian. I think therefore this object is or I think therefore these objects are. There is another saying, we see things more as we are rather than as they are. This is a saying that comes from the Talmud. So to seek to bring the items to life through making use of the minds and the bodies of those who descend from the legacies of colonization and enslavement can be seen to be part of a decolonial act. At the very least, it is a move towards another kind of telling, maybe another kind of showing. We're grateful to Rianne Rosen, the curator of the collections, which are the works of Broughton, Long and Lindsay. And we're also grateful to Bristol Museum, more generally, for the opportunity to let these items speak out a new narrative. We trust that you will enjoy engaging with a different, more emancipatory imaginary than that which has been assigned to these objects so far. Let the lions roar.
I am an indigene of the marginal lands. I am an artifact of your constructs. My whole anatomy has been divided up, you see, quite arbitrarily, reclassified into flower, stem and shoot, mind and body, soul and root, reclassified into class, gender and race, allotted different kinds of space, but I am who I am. This seed was the originator, original, the wild type, aboriginal. This seed was the source of all seed. This seed was curated by my womb. I trace a long line through my genetic legacy right back to the honeybee when we all lived in harmony, the angiosperms, and we, we evolved together. We trace a lineage forward to the human race. It's why we talk about one, one love. love. One heart, let's get together and feel all right. And it's why all that plundering is such a disgrace. Disgrace, 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 race, 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 race. You see, when my seed was taken, you also took my story too. How we had our way of interacting, transacting, acting within nature, we said. As above and so below, we blended in with nature, so we cultivated her, we let her grow. But then the greedy ones came and suppressing, manipulating, raiding, fleecing, pickpocketing, cheating, stripping, depriving, removing, denying. On my shores, your clippers landed, lied and cheated, your trinket sold, my blood depleted. When you ripped us from the earth, the earth too was scarred, who knew our worth. JP Morgan, RBS, Lehman Brothers and Yale, <laughs> they've heaped up so much profit, could make a black person turn pale. Though we don't mention reparation, seems like our labor has just went. The seed has suffered, is still suffering. Five whole centuries, energy spent. My body was pharmaceutically poisoned. Through artificial fertilizers and chemicals to make the seeds grow fast. That's Mama Earth violated and abused. Lord, how much longer can this last? Adventurers arrived. Ambassadors of other worlds, bring in their values, religions and ways, capturing many boys and girls. When we ripped the people from the earth, we also ripped the earth from the people, scarring us traumatizing us we bleed we bleed we bleed all for the sake of greed the cherry pepper is rather an ornament than a youthful plant. 
being but little made use of, though I know not for what reason, as it is not only a fleshy fruit, but full as hot and poignant as the negro. Pepper, and I think full as delicate to the palate. In color and size, they are so like the European cherry that strangers are sometimes drawn in by their waggish acquaintances to eat of them as such, though I think to see one's friend in burning agony at a couple of hours must be a cruel sort of pleasure, and those that practice it chew either an unfeeling heart. Four acres to such a bag is a very good medium for a good middling cotton year, and in this case his fifty slaves, which if you value at the rate of seventy-five per head, makes three thousand seven hundred and fifty pounds, and which six per centum per annum will raise the sum of two hundred and twenty-five pounds, were it in specie and given out at interest, make him fifty bags, which, at the usual calculation of twenty-five pounds per bag, is one thousand two hundred and fifty pounds. Now if you deduct the two hundred and twenty-five pounds, the annual value of your slaves, which I here charge because a perishable property, and need now and then a recruit, there is the sum of one thousand and twenty-five pounds left for the planter's pocket, of which fifty pounds will more than defy his contingent expenses, supposing he oversees his own field. The poor poultry is but very indifferently described by any author hitherto. Sir H. Sloane calls it Papaya Major Flore e Fructu Majoribus, and C. Linnaeus has it Carica Foliorum Lobis Sinuatus. Brown, in his History of Jamaica, has it Fronde Comosa, Folis Peltato Lobatus. This tree grows everywhere within the torrid zone. I have met with it as far north as Tenerife. It is of easy propagation and of very quick growth, so that though its continueth be not many years, yet its increase makes it an object of a good planter's attention, for it begins to bear fruit about six months old. When it is not above six feet from the ground, and from that time till it dies away, this plant has remained since the conquest from the Spaniards, and still, especially towards the north side of the island, is pretty much planted by the Negroes for the use of the pipe, to which the Negroes are greatly enslaved. Indeed, they alleged that this alone is what make their other slavery the more tolerable. Perhaps it is a native. If not, and only introduced by the Spaniards from some other of their islands, perhaps Cuba, it ever the ness strives at luxuriant as if it were.
The new emphasis on race, against the finer distinctions recognised in nation, derived in part from the generalising and homogenising tendencies of slavery and imperialism. It was apparent in works such as Raynaud's Histoire, 1770, and Robertson's History of America, 1777, as well as in the writings of Thomas Jefferson and Benjamin Franklin, though others, such as Buffon, persisted in emphasising the internal diversity of Africa and the Americas. The mixing of African nations in American slave societies, as well as the emergence of a relatively homogeneous Creole population, contributed to the European perception of u uniformity. Black Africans, Negroes, came to be attributed a general uniformity or race that transcended region and nation. It was a way of reducing the plenitude of variation in human physical types to a relatively small number of possible classes or groups and placing them in a hierarchy of human worth. These European tendencies of thought derived from imperialism and slavery came to receive authority from science. It was only through science that race came to have a precise definition, taken to mean a set of physical characteristics, notably skin colour and morphology, or a biological classification that could describe or measure differences between human groups and between the individuals belonging to those groups. Only in the later 17th century did Europeans begin to include human beings within the scope of natural history and to think of people as varying in the same way as plants and animals and equally open to systematic classification, an attitude of mind in which Lindsay showed little interest. Gradually, humans came to be assimilated into the animal kingdom rather than distinguished because they were thought to possess souls. Linnaeus included humans only in the second edition of his General System of Nature, published in 1740, raising eyebrows by subjecting humankind to the same taxonomic principles he had applied to plants and animals. Linnaeus here divided people into four categories. Europeus albus, Americanus rubescens, Asiaticus fuscus, and Africanus niger, on the dual basis of continent and skin colour. This scientific system of classification not only departed from the biblical tripartite division derived from Noah's sons, but also laid the foundation for a scientific racism that matched popular European Christian notions that distinguished red and yellow, black and white. Thus, humans became a species first termed Homo sapiens by Linnaeus in the canonical 10th edition of his work, published in 1758, rather than a special part of the natural kingdom distinguished by reason. The orangutan lacking language was not included. Linnaeus was a special creationist, believing that each species was created specifically by God 
and he came only reluctantly to accept that new species might be created by hybridization. He saw humanity as a continuum, divisible into varieties, but the idea of race and its corollary, degeneracy, emerged ultimately as the dominant concept. Right. Um, I think we all just need to take a breath after that. Um, thank you very much, Mamadi and Rianne, for putting that together to us, for us. Um, I'm really glad that we're going to be able to put this online through Natska um, uh, in the coming days. It'd be great for this to reach a wider audience. I've um, got one question from someone saying, um, was this presentation or installation displayed anywhere publicly? Um, is is Mama D there as well? I, I am. I okay. don't see why my picture's not showing, but anyway. <laughs> <laughs> we can hear you. <laughs> yeah, could you ask the question once more? Um, was this presentation or installation displayed anywhere publicly? Well, we did. Ah, hello, Mama D. <laughs> um, we did have an event in the museum for this. And um, would you like to explain? Yeah, so we had a, a something from which this has been derived, which is a full, very live, touchy-feely, <laughs> um, fully immersive experience um, that was in Bristol Museum. Um, and this, this particular um, presentation hasn't been shown anywhere, though, but I think it's going to be on Bristol Museum website, I believe. We, yes, we hope to show it on Bristol Museum website soon, too. Brilliant. Um, and then we've got another question in the chat, which was, who crafted the poem, Let the Lion Roar? Could you tell us a little bit more about that, please? <laughs> no, that was just a one-liner <laughs> derived, <laughs> derived from Chinua Achebe's um, quotation about, you know, lions and historians, which is a fairly well-known quote, and you can read more about Chinua Achebe online anywhere, but it's a, a very appropriate um, expression I believe for the the entirety of the talk today the conference so yes I just derived yeah, we've had the, 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 the lines there. draw <laughs> unfortunately you're all frozen so I'm just going to assume that I'm carrying on oh there you are Oh, my internet connection is unstable. Always a helpful comment. Right. Um, well, I uh, would really be very interested in where your collaboration actually started and came from. If you could talk us a little bit more about how a museum and Mamadi got together, then I think a lot of our audience would be really interested in that. Well, we were fortunate enough to get funding from the British Society History of Science that allowed us to take on a student that had to produce an event associated with our Lindsay Broughton and Long collection. And um, we, we came across Mama D, fortunately, um, and he was very keen to have Mama D on board. Um, but we did have 
a lot of challenges and issues in the museum being a council museum um, and it involved food and smells and a lot of mystery around it and we wanted to market it as a mystery but we we were told that we weren't allowed to we had to give away more information and the event um, you need to be blindfolded so that you can smell and see and remember the experience better um, we did manage most of the challenges but only thanks to Mama D um, persevering over every hurdle that I put in her face and the worst thing happened on the day Mama D had a nasty fall and hit her head and then the kitchen didn't open so yeah we had challenges galore but it was a success and thanks Thank heaven it was, and then we got to um, share that part of the experience. Although, had it been an event, you would have experienced it perhaps with blindfolds at the Natka conference. And I would have brought you your fruit. <laughs> and Mama D, how is it working with the museum? Have you worked with them before? I haven't. This, that was the first time, and as I said, it was quite an eventful <laughs> experience. Um, working i mean it, it's it's i guess part of what miranda was saying and others have echoed in different ways throughout this conference there are lots of challenges naturally institutional challenges for people from outside to work within the context of a museum and in that i would include somebody said i think libraries art collections and um, and botanical gardens which are an important repository of connection between um, across uh, colonial history, right? Um, <laughs> and certainly, I mean, I don't know if they, you know, if there are any, is if there's anybody here from a botanical garden, but I, I'm sure there are a few, right? So I hope that the conversation is extended to them more, you know, as the as the conference continues over the the years. But yeah, very interesting, very very challenging. But I hope that with presentations like this, with conversations like this, that um, the possibility of connecting with communities that relate to the subject matter of the collections is going to be made easier. <laughs> Brilliant. Okay, well, I'm sorry that was so short, but thank you so much for taking the time to join us today. I'm delighted to say that is not it. We've still got a panel discussion from all of our speakers today. So um, this is me signing off saying thank you so much to Mamadi, Rianne and Jim for giving us two very interesting presentations, talks. Um, and I'll pass you over to Isla, who's going to chair the next session. Thanks very much.